Well, hi everyone. My name's Steve Layson. I'm part of the ministry team here at Jeringong Anglican Church. I'd like to welcome you to our online prayer book service today. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Um, we've just finished a, new, a series looking at some of the Psalms. Uh, and now as we, as we lead up to Easter, uh, we're going to spend some time focusing on Jesus, uh, appropriately so. So we're starting a new series looking at the end of the book of Matthew. Over the last three years, we've looked at the first three quarters of Matthew's Gospel. And so now we come to the climax, to the, uh, the, point, the pointy end, if you like, of the Gospel as we, as we lead up and we follow Jesus to the cross. And so I'd like to invite you to join us over the, coming, uh, the next two months. Uh, we're going to spend 10 weeks looking at one week of Jesus' life. Uh, you might like to, uh, in fact, if you've got time, to read through Matthew's Gospel, to remind yourself of the story so far, but also to, uh, to start to focus on, on the chapters we'll be looking at, starting at chapter 21 today. We're also going to be following the, uh, the first order of communion that you'll find on, the, on page 114 of the Green Australian Prayer Books. Uh, so if you have one of those handy, you might need one of those in a moment. Uh, but before we get to that, we're going to start off by, start off by singing the... So, taking up our, our, our green prayer books, let us turn to page 114. The Lord be with you. To begin our service, let's hear from the Word of God, from Psalm 95. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hands. Page 114, let us pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us and write your law in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Before we hear from God's word, let me pray the colic for today. 
God, our strength and refuge, the author of all godliness, hear the devout prayers of your church and grant that what we ask in faith we may surely obtain through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to hear from God's word now. Our Old Testament reading is from the book of the prophet Zechariah from chapter 9 and we will be beginning with verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken And he will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And as for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope, Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. Then the Lord will appear over them and his arrow will flash like lightning. The Sovereign Lord will sound the trumpet. He will march in the storms of the south and the Lord Almighty will shield them. They will destroy and overcome with sling stones. They will drink and roar as with wine. They will be full like a bowl used for sprinkling the corners of the altar. The Lord their God will save them on that day as the flock of his people. They will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. How attractive and beautiful they will be. Grain will make the young men thrive and new wine the young women. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My name is Shirley Cody and I attend the eight AM service here at St. George's, Jeringong. I would like to take the opportunity of wishing the um, Lacey family a happy wedding that they um, just celebrated with their son, Nick, and their new daughter-in-law, Hannah. Lots of blessings and lots of love And may you have a long, prosperous, and happy marriage. The Gospel according to Matthew 21, I'm so enthusiastic. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with a colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thanks, Shirley and Bruce. Before we uh, look more intently at God's word together, will you join with me in the words of the Nicene Creed? You'll find them on page 117. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, my guess is that many, will, many of you will have heard of the child that was born in the Roman Empire over 2,000 years ago who would change the course of history. As the child grew, uh, his power would, co would command the loyalty of thousands upon thousands. By the time he was in his 30s, uh, he would be seen as the fulfilment of the nation's hopes uh, and the founder of an endless kingdom. His achievements would be considered miraculous, signs of divine authority, particularly the way he established peace uh, in a period marked with chaos. So significant was this man's entry into history that official proclamations known as Gospels were published throughout the world in his honour. One such, such proclamation describes how the year of his uh, this Saviour's birth was henceforth to be known as Year One in a whole new calendar system. I speak, of course, of a man by the name of Gaius Octavius, or Caesar Augustus, who was born in 63 BC and was the first emperor of Rome. The language of Saviour, Gospel and peace to all people was not unique to Jesus. The Roman emperors saw themselves this way. They were the supreme rulers over the entire empire, and no one could match them, let alone replace them. They were to be worshipped as gods. It's into this background that Jesus is born and grows up. And most significantly, <coughs> and most significantly, against the all-conquering power of the Roman Empire, as we'll see today, he's proclaimed as king of an eternal empire himself, one that still exists today. You see, Jesus was born, as we're told in Luke's Gospel, during a census being carried out by this emperor, Caesar Augustus. Um, his birth was seen to be a threat to the local authority, Herod, who tried to, uh, but failed, to have him put to death. Over the past three years, we've been looking at Matthew's Gospel, um, looking at the person of Jesus. Uh, you may remember, last year we looked at chapters 14 to 20, and we looked at the wonder of Jesus, his teaching, his miracles. And now, over the next couple of months, we're going to be following him to the climax, the, the whole purpose of his coming to earth in the first place, as we look at the last eight chapters of Matthew. In chapter 16, if you have a really good memory, you might remember that his disciples recognised him as the Messiah, the long-awaited king of the Jews, um, who would bring peace and salvation and this everlasting kingdom we're talking about. But now... Uh, in, our, in today's passage, we can see that private knowledge becomes very public indeed. Uh, throughout the passage, in four different ways, Jesus is proclaimed to be the true king. 
this passage is actually really, clearly pretty significant. It's one of the few passages that are actually in all four of the Gospels. And it's good to, it's, and so Jesus enters in Jerusalem uh, in Matthew 21, and it's good to have a good entrance, isn't it? Um, I was, had the privilege of being at my, my son's wedding yesterday, and his bride-to-be um, had a pretty big entrance, walking down the aisle with every eye fixed upon her. Um, the whole congregation was watching and, and was excited about what was about to happen. Well, Jesus too has a big entrance, and every eye is upon him. It's not like quite quite like that of a bride or some kind of, or even a you know political leader like a, uh, a Donald Trump or a Joe Biden or anything like that. Um, Jesus and his disciples approach Jerusalem, and there is a large crowd with them. We hear about that uh, in Matthew twenty verse twenty nine. Large crowds have gathered because of what Jesus has been doing. But before they get there, Jesus sends two of his disciples on ahead in Matthew 21, verse 2, with special instructions about finding a donkey and her colt tied up. He instructs them to bring them to him. They duly do what Jesus asks, and a large crowd that is with Jesus put their cloaks and their palm branches on the ground. So Jesus uh, winds up riding into Jerusalem on a donkey uh, with people yelling and cheering. It's like he's, he's coming down the red carpet into the capital city. The, the big question, of course, is why? Why does he choose to come in like this? He's actually been to Jerusalem plenty of times before, but never like this. Why the donkey? Why is he going, coming in this direction, in this way? Well, the answer, of course, is in the Old Testament, in the, the, the uh, Bible reading we have from Zechariah chapter 9. Let me read to you from Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. When Jesus rides into Jerusalem, he comes on a donkey because he's coming to proclaim himself as king. You see, this passage from Zechariah 9 was written to a nation in pain. They'd been in exile for 70 years. Now they've been able to kind of trickle back home, but it was never like it was. Um, everything was all just a bit second rate. But now God was going to send a king to re-establish things as they were, in fact, even better. And so Jesus has chosen the fulfilment of this prophecy to declare his kingship by riding in on a donkey. By riding in, he's saying, I am this king that has been promised. I am bringing righteousness and salvation and will proclaim peace to the nations. This kingdom is going to be a kingdom that doesn't end, that stretches from sea to sea. But of course, the story doesn't end there. For when Jesus enters the city, the first place he goes is to the temple. But of course, he doesn't go to the temple um, for a sightseeing tour. He has a very important task to do. And you can imagine as he gets in, the crowds are still there. They haven't disappeared. He's come to the very centre, the very heart of the capital city. And the people are following him. They're keen to see what's going to happen. And what does Jesus do? Does he take part in the worship? Does he um, bring a sacrifice? No, this is what he does. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. Imagine the... The ruckus that that would have caused. Jesus coming into the temple, it'd be like Jesus walking into the Jericho markets and turning over all of the stalls. You can imagine the, the, the huge crowd sitting back in wonder and looking at what's going on here. How on earth can he can do this? He's gone into the temple, it seems like he's flipped his lid. But once more, Jesus explains that what he's doing uh, has its roots in the Old Testament. He actually quotes from Isaiah 56 which says, my house will be held, called a house of prayer for all people. You see, Jesus has come as king, um, but he's not just come as king of Israel. He's come to bring in the nations. In Isaiah verse 56, it's talking about God bringing in the nations into, into the kingdom so that they too can worship God. So to do this, Jesus has to clear out the court of the Gentiles. It seems that it had been turned much into very much a marketplace um, so that people couldn't actually come there to worship. There were people buying and selling and uh, all those sounds of animals everywhere and um, haggling over prices. Um, a huge noise. 
And so there's not really a place where you could come to worship God. And so Jesus has to clear out this court um, to show that he is not just the king of the Jews, but the king of all people. But of course, not, that's not even the end. You see, while Jesus is still in the temple, um, some more people come to him in verse 14. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. He come, people come and Jesus continues that ministry, uh, the miraculous ministry of healing people. Now again, it's not as if everybody's gone home um, before these things. These are very public, they're very obvious actions. But again, why does Jesus do this in the middle of the temple? Well, again, Jesus is revealing something to the crowds um, that it seems that only the disciples had realised up until this point. And again, it's to do with the fact of who he is. In Isaiah 36, verse 4, Isaiah looks forward to the coming of God to rescue his people and he says... Be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. You see, Jesus is the king of, of God's people, Israel. But he's also the king of the whole world, of all people. But he's not just king over people, he's a king over everything. He's the ruler over all things, even over nature itself. We've seen it as we read through Matthew's Gospel, we've seen Jesus do incredible things. And now he does it in front of the crowds to make it perfectly clear who he is. He is the king. But even more than that, as Jesus comes in king, as a king, he comes as God. Your God will come, says Isaiah. With vengeance, your God will open the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf and make the lame leap like a deer. It is God who does these things. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem at the beginning of the last week of his life, he wants it to be perfectly clear to all and sundry, to whoever can see, that he is not just a, a, a nice religious prophet. He's not just a religious leader. He's not just a, a, a model that we can follow. He is the king. And he has come to bring restoration, to bring salvation, to bring peace and healing. So that's three ways we've seen Jesus as king. He comes riding on a donkey, fulfilling the promises of Zechariah 9. He comes into the temple and opening up the place for prayer for all people. And he comes and brings healing to those in need, just as, as was promised. But the final way we see Jesus' kingship being declared is in what the people say. As Jesus enters into Jerusalem, um, the people shout out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when the people in the temple see what Jesus is doing, they too shout, Hosanna to the son of David. What does that mean? Well, these people have caught a glimpse of who Jesus is declaring himself to be. They recognise that he is the son of David. Now, they're not just talking about his heritage, oh, he happens to have a nice family line. That little phrase actually scattered throughout the Gospel. Um, and it refers, of course, to the promised son of David. Back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promises David that one of his children, his son, will rule over all things. His kingdom will last forever. It will be a kingdom that is characterised by peace and wholeness and God's blessing. Jesus is this son of David, this king that has been promised. The people recognise it. And the appropriate response is Hosanna, which means God save us. If God's king is here, he should act. So they cry out to God to act and to rescue them. And again, even this cry has echoes from the Old Testament. In Psalm 118, verse 21, we read these words. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine upon us. 
with bows in hand, join in a festal procession up to the horns of the altar. Can you see, can you hear the echoes of what's happening here in Matthew 21? You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Matthew wants us to look back and to see this, to remember this passage from Psalm 118. He uses the same words, Hosanna, God save us. But he also says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord in verse 26. And he see, it pictures people um, worshipping with bows in hand as they come in a procession up to the horns of the altar in God's temple. So why would, why would Matthew want us to recall this psalm? Well, because he wants us to make the connection that Jesus is the capstone that the builders rejected. He is the, the most important stone, the foundation stone. That he is God and he will give him th thanks and will be exalted. You see, the reason that Jesus is the king over the Jews, over the Gentiles and even over nature is because he is God himself. God himself has come to rescue his people. Now when the religious leaders see this and they hear these words, they are angry. They demand that Jesus does something to stop them. But again, Jesus goes back to the, goes back to the Old Testament in Psalm 8. He quotes Psalm 8 when he says, um, Even the little ones, from the lips of children and infants, we have ordained praise. God is, in Psalm 8, talking about praise of God. And now Jesus applies that to himself. Even here, Jesus is speaking of his majesty and his glory. He is worthy of the same praise as God. The true king is not Caesar, not Caesar Augustus. The true king is Jesus. He always has been and he always will be. So what do we do with this passage, this declaration of Jesus the king? Well, it seems to me there are two vital responses that we need to make. And the first one is to ask ourselves the question, have I recognised Jesus as king? In Matthew 16, Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say I am? And they respond with, yes, you are the king. You are God's king. And so we're to ask ourselves the same question. Who do we say Jesus is? And this is no trivial pursuit question. It's a question that will impact our, our eternal life. I wonder if you ever tried to talk to someone who doesn't believe in God and try to explain to them uh, where your faith comes from. Uh, it's almost impossible. In fact, it is impossible to prove God's existence. We just can't do it. And we can argue round and round in circles. If people won't believe, don't believe in God, they, they can find it very difficult, no matter what we, what we say or do. But of course, we don't need to persuade people. We don't need to make people believe. What we need to do is to introduce people to Jesus. It's him that they need to respond to, not us. They don't need to agree with our point of view. They need to respond to Jesus as he has revealed himself. Everyone, one day, will see Jesus face to face. And they will bow before him, whether they like it or not. So in your conversations with, not, with people who aren't yet Christians, let me encourage you to continue to bring them back to Jesus. He is the one that they need to respond to as king. But then the second question, of course, is, if we recognise that Jesus is the king, to ask ourselves, then, what, to what extent do I see his rule in my life? In this passage, we see him as the the leader, the, the king of God's people, of the king of, of all people, and the king of all, of all things, the whole universe. Have we allowed Jesus to become king of every part of our lives? There were plenty of people on that day who were yelling, Hosanna, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, who seven days later were baying for his blood. Jesus doesn't just want people to shout from the sidelines uh, as if, uh, Jesus is, is collecting supporters. No, Jesus wants followers. He wants people who submit their lives to him, who recognise that he's the king and give themselves over to him. He wants us to obey not our own desires, but his will. He doesn't want us to follow the opinion of our culture, but the word of the Lord as has been revealed to us. He is the king and we need to treat him as such. We need to obey him and seek to honour him with everything that we have, with all that we do, 
with our time, with our money, with our energy, with our relationships, uh, with our jobs, with our retirements. No matter who we are, no matter what we are, what stage of life we're in, Jesus is still our King. Matthew 21 is a beautiful passage which describes Jesus coming into Jerusalem uh, in meekness, in humility, riding on a donkey. But pretty soon, Jesus will return in glory, in power and majesty, and all people will be drawn to him. I wonder if you'll be ready for him when he comes. Have you submitted yourself to him as your king? Are you living with him as your king? Submitting every part of your life to him. Jesus is the king who comes to rescue you and to give you life. Will you give your allegiance to him? Let me pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we praise you for who you are, the king of all things, the king of all people. Lord Jesus, we pray that you might help us to live with you as our king. For all those who are watching who don't know you yet, Lord, I pray that you might open their hearts to be able to see Jesus for who he really is. That they might be able to acknowledge him as the king of all things and even the, the king of them. And Father, we pray for all of us, for all those who have given their life to Jesus, that we wouldn't do it in a part-time way. We wouldn't uh, put Jesus to the, the sidelines of our lives, but that we would recognise him as king over every part of who we are and what we do. Lord, help us to submit ourselves to him and his authority. We ask this in his precious name. Amen. Well, one of the amazing things about Christ our King is that he invites us to come and bring our prayers and our requests to him. So will you join with me in the prayers? You'll find them on page 120. Let us pray for all people and for the church throughout the world. Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We ask you in your mercy to accept our alms and oblations and to receive our prayers which we offer to your divine majesty. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the ways of righteousness and peace and guide their rulers in wisdom and justice for the tranquility and good of all. We pray especially for the worldwide handling of the COVID pandemic. We thank you for the appearance of vaccines, and we pray, Lord, that they might uh, be rolled out with, uh, with fairness and equity. We particularly pray for those nations that can't afford uh, the expensive vaccines, that they might be made about, available to them as well. Bless especially your servant, Elizabeth, our Queen, her representatives and ministers, her parliaments, and all who exercise authority in this land. Grant that they may impartially administer justice, restrain wickedness and vice, and uphold integrity and truth. We particularly pray for our government as they think through uh, the, the care of those who are seeking asylum. Uh, there are many who have been locked up. Uh, we found it difficult to be locked up in our homes, but Lord, there are people who have been locked away uh, for a long, long time with no hope of, of, of release. Lord, we pray that a fair uh, and loving response will be able to be found for them. We also ask you of your goodness, Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness or any other adversity. We bring before you people who are known to us in our own hearts uh, at this point. Father, as a church, we pray for our, our brothers and sisters who are struggling at the moment. We pray for um, Greg and Michelle Thornton. We pray for Edith Burgess, uh, for David Mulready, uh, and for Val Cuthbertson as they, as they recover from surgeries. Lord, we ask that you might bring them back to full health soon. We also pray for those who are grieving lost loved ones, particularly over the last year. We beseech you to inspire continually the Universal Church with a spirit of truth unity and concord, and grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. We pray particularly for our missionaries who are taking the gospel out to the world on our behalf. We pray for the cows in Italy, that you might help them to uh, deal well with the difficulties of lockdown in that country. That please keep them safe and give them the opportunity to share, your, share their faith uh, with, those they, with those they meet. We pray also... Uh, for the Damons in Mudgee, we ask, Lord, that you might continue to help them as they seek to reach out and, and lead their church in disciple-making in that place. 
And Father, we thank you uh, for the Glovers. We thank you for the opportunity to, to see them in our church today. And we ask, Lord, that you might uh, bless them as they go back to Cambodia, that they might be able to pick up where they left off, that their church may continue to grow and be a light in, the, in, the, in that dark place. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that by their life and teaching they may set forth your true and life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. In particular, Lord, we pray for the election of the new Archbishop this year. We pray that a man after your own heart will be appointed to that position so that the ministry of the gospel in this diocese may go forward. And to this congregation here present, oh, and to all your people, give your heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that they may receive your word with reverent and obedient hearts and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. In particular, Lord, we pray in the light of our, our, our passage today that we might learn what it means for us to live with you as our King in every part of our lives. We also bless your holy name for all your servants who have died in the faith of Christ. Give us grace to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of your eternal kingdom. Grant this, Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we who come to receive the Holy Communion of the body and blood of our Saviour Christ can come only because of his great love for us. For although we are completely undeserving of his love, yet in order to raise us from the darkness of death to everlasting life as God's sons and daughters, our Saviour Christ humbled himself to share our life and to die for us on the cross. In remembrance of his death and as a pledge of his love, he has instituted this holy sacrament which we are now to share. But those who would eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord must examine themselves and amend their lives. They must come with a penitent heart and a steadfast faith. Above all, they must give thanks to God for his love towards us in Christ Jesus. You then, who truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead a new, new life, following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to strengthen and comfort you. But first, let's make a humble confession of our sins to Almighty God. On page 122, let us pray together. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Maker of all things, Judge of all men, we acknowledge with shame the sins we have committed by thought, word and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for all our misdoings. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that from this time forward we may serve and please you in unity of life to the honour and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins, to all who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear these words of assurance for those who truly turn to Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So, lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Lord, Holy Father, mighty creator and eternal God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, O Lord Most High. And over the page on 125, let's pray this prayer of the humble access together. 
We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. If you haven't already done so, you might like to organise some bread and some wine or some juice as we share the Lord's Supper together. Let us pray. All glory to you, our Heavenly Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and who instituted in his holy gospel, commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. Well, taking the bread... Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ's body was broken for you and be thankful. In the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. In Matthew 5 we read, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Let us pray. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord and Heavenly Father, we, your servants, entirely desire your fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And to grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, that we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy and living sacrifice, humbly beseeching you that all we who are partakers of this Holy Communion may be fulfilled with your grace and heavenly benediction. And although we are unworthy through our many sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we pray that you will accept this, the duty and service we owe, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offences, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit all honour and glory are yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. We've almost come to the end of our service, uh, but let us celebrate our King, Uh, Let's sing his praises as we look forward to the day when every knee will bow and recognise him as Lord. So let's sing together at the name of Jesus.
we've almost come to the end of our service today. Uh, but before we do, just a quick reminder, uh, if you are living in Jeringong or in the, in the area and you're able to come and join us live for church today, uh, that, that would be a great opportunity to, uh, to catch up with Andrew and Liz Glover, who will be joining us for all three of our services. So I hope you're able to come and join us uh, and meet with them and, and chat with them um, after, after the service. I'd also like to remind you that if you're having trouble uh, connecting with our, um, our church database, then please uh, contact Susan or myself uh, and we'll try and help you to uh, get your details up to date so that we can uh, run our rosters and our church directory and those kinds of things. Uh, it would be helpful if you could uh, get that organised soon. So please get in touch with us if you're, if you're having trouble. But to finish off our service, let's finish off with this great blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding... Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next time.